volume is kind of low, I guess. Give me a second for me to fix that. <coughs> Okay, here we go. This is better, I think. All right. That's weird. Where's the stacks gone? I answered all of this. Anyway, let me set up my two screens also music would be nice last time what did we do for music was HBO realm music Maybe Oh I have to let people know the, that I'm streaming. I completely forgot. Let me open the Discord. I'm streaming. Yay. Now for the music. Um, what can I do? Does I Claudius have a soundtrack? It was a good uh, Roman TV series. I seem to have some music apparently. Let's see. That's unexpected. Um, what can we try? Age of Empires Rise of Rome. Sure. What? This is not very Roman. We're gonna try that. very old hello okay so hello Gandalf how are you Let's read some Latin. Bella et Rosa. The girl and the rose. Eque Marcus et Quintus ante ostium vile. I forgot what is eque. I mean eque. Eque is horse. 
but it can't now I think here see look so see Marcus and Quintus uh, in front of the ostium what is ostium A door. Okay. Do you have this here? Pretty sure this wasn't the last one. But I'm gonna. This is a row chapter six stuff. I'm gonna put this on seven. And I mean this door. This is the music from the music is Age of Empires 2 uh, Rise of Rome. It's very weird music, but it's nice. I think it's just kind of old. It's good. So in front of the door of the house. Pretty Julium Expectant. Expectant's probably waiting. So they're waiting for Julius. Mater non est apud filius. The mother is not with the children. Ea in peristilo est. She's in the peristilum. What is the was what was the Paris law again? I think it was just its own thing. Oh god, Paris law. I'm writing this wrong, am I not? That oh, it's with the first. There you go. The inner courtyard surrounded by columns. This very specific word. Okay, so she is in that courtyard. Illic virum sum expectat. There are some some new words here. So virum sum is probably her man, and she expectat is wait. So he's, she's waiting for her man. But what is it? What is illic? I don't remember seeing this before. No information. I think it should be Peristilo. But this is Peristilo. Um, it is a surname? No, it's not here. Illic in Peristilo. So Illic means in Peristilo, or where is that? Not. Oh, it's two L's. She. Okay, it's just she. Well, 
kind of... Why do you have... If it's just she, why do you have an pedistolo here? Anyway, we'll just keep going. Maybe this will make sense later. Emilia Leta Nonest. So, Emilia is not happy. Quia Julius Abist. Because Julius is absent. Nam Emilia Virum Sum Amat. For Emilia loves her man. Hello, Argo Crusader. I'm reading Latin. What's going on with you? Obi est Julia. Where is Julia? In cubiculo suo est. She's in her room. Julia, que sola est ilic. Oh, here we have the leak again. So Yulia, who is alone, why the illic? Why do you need a she in that sentence? Watching your read Latin, nice. Um, Rosum ante nasum tenet. She has roses in a form in front of her nose, or a single rose. Puella lacrimat in oculis eius sunt lacrimae. So the girl cries, in her eyes there are tears. Julia speculum sumit et ante oculos tenet. So there's a mirror speculum. Sumit is to take, I think, if I remember correctly. Yes. So uh, So Yulia takes a mirror and has it in front of her eyes. Is, am I right with the tenet? Or is that like to put or something? Hello Tapioca, how are you? Yeah, hold. Hold, have. So she takes the mirror and holds it in front of her eyes. Puella se in speculo videt et se interrogat. The girl uh, sees herself in the mirror and asks herself. Est ne fedus nasus meus? <laughs> Isn't my nose ugly? Nasus eius autem formosus non est. Um, autem. So it's just like, but her nose is not beautiful or something autumn is but autumn is another word just like said it means but weird home in languages have practically the same word for nose that's true gandalf um, they all come from latin i guess Must be all the Indo-European. Yeah, maybe. Maybe it's even older than Latin. Uh, 
Yulia Ursus Lacrimat. I forgot what Ur Ursus means. Turned back, back, backwards. But I, there was something about Rursus that I wrote here. That was like, again, backwards, turn back. Oh, so it can be again. And that's something that doesn't show here. And it usually means again in this, in this story. So, she cries again after asking herself in the mirror. Soldier than Latin, cause known Romans languages have it too. Okay, interesting. So there we go. I mean, we can check Wiktionary. It's usually pretty good at that. So we can put Nasus here, which is the Latin word for nose. And it will you usually show the Proto-Indo-European uh, origin, which is something like. Nez or something. So yeah, there we go. You're right. Anyway. Sira ostium cubiculi pulsat. Sira was the slave, I think. Ostium is the door, pulsat can be like knock on the door, and the cubicle is the room, so Sira knocks on the door of her room. Julia, entra. And uh, Julia says, come in. Sira ostium aperit et in cubiculum intrat. So, Sira opens the door and enters the room. Neque ostium post se claudit. And not the door post se claudit. I'm not sure what claudit means. Uh, post is like. in front or behind. I always confuse which one. But cloud it, I don't know. Uh, shut, so she's closing the door. After her, maybe? And not? No, but in not. Ostium post, the cloud it. Here we have, do you have some explanation for that? Claudit Aperit. So yeah, Aperit is to open, Claudit is to close. But I'm not sure why it's a knot. Or is Neque something else that I'm missing? No, a knot. So is she not closing the door? I don't know. If, if someone knows the answer to this, please let me know. Like, is she not closing the door and what is exactly the meaning of the sentence? Julia Siram post se in speculo videt. I mean, can I have some. A meaning for se? So this is uh, some form of himself herself. So she prob she's probably not closing the door after herself. And Yulia, in she sees in the mirror Sita. After herself, Sira non vidit lacrimas Julia. Sira, Sira doesn't see the tears of Julia. 
nam pula senon vertit for the girl uh, doesn't something herself i don't know what vertit is Uh, doesn't turn she's not turning towards her I guess she doesn't turn herself maybe uh, I need to write this one Vertit is to turn Sira Oh, hic est mea puella. So here is my girl. Veni in hortum, Julia. Uh, come to the garden, Julia. Julia imperat. Claude ostium. Oh, here we have her saying close the door. So yeah, she didn't close the door. There we go. Mystery solved, guys. So, Yulia commands her to close the door. Ankila parit. What is par parit again? It's like to obey? To peer? This is what? Appear be visible. Ankila parit. Like the, the slave shows up, but she already she, she really showed up. Can but it mean something else, maybe? But you. Beer. Oh, obey. So. It can be obeyed. I don't know if I have this in the... But it obey. You can also be to appear. So she obeys and closes the door. Yulia, num... Nasus meus fuedus est, Sira. Uh, isn't my nose ugly, Sira? And Sira says, Fuedus ugly? Imo formosus est nasus tuus. What is Imo? I haven't seen that. Imo is. No, indeed, by no means on the contrary. Nay. Okay. Which one should I go with? Nay. Nay. Or was it Emo or Eno? Emo, okay. So, on the contrary, uh, your nose is beautiful. Julia Sivertit, so Julia turns herself. Iam Sira Lacrimas Videt, and now Sira sees the tears. Sira, quid est mea Julia? Tergi Oculus, what is Tergi? A lot of new words here. A nearer occurred. Sure. Tergi. Third person of Tergiri. Sure, so what is Tergiri? To wipe clean, to, to clear. So clear your eyes. So 
so it's like what quid est is like what is it right yeah as later you're happy what is later what is what does the is mean be be happy so be happy your nose is as beautiful as mine Julia said nasus tus non formosus est but your nose is not beautiful Kuterge means something different in Latin compared to Italian. I I don't know what's the meaning in Italian, but sure, there are false cognates. Like words that seem to mean the same thing but mean different things. And uh, Terge was to wipe clean to clear. I don't know what, what it what it means in Italian. Uh, Sira quid non e formosus est nasus meus. What? My nose is not uh, pretty. Julia, on the contrary, it is ugly. Imo fedus est. Eke speculum, Sira. Here's the mirror, Sira. Julia speculum tenet ante Siram. So Julia holds the mirror in front of Sira. Que nasum sum in speculo videt, who sees her nose in uh, the mirror. Ancilla oculus claudit et tacit. The slave clears her eyes, opens her eyes, and uh, tacit. What is tacit again? To be silent, to say nothing. You're looking up there again in Italian? Oops. That was a mistake. But it does seem to be the same thing. There go back reverse coiner medal. That was the The there they have it on this dictionary. Just giving me some error here. So weird. Alternative farmer of Turgeo. It's so annoying how I can't find the to rub, to rub wipe off clean, yeah it's the same meaning. Hey Lucas I found you on reddit, it was, it was from your game design plans. Oh hello, Sinister Shane, welcome. Uh, from Art Game Dev I guess. It might mean dry. Yeah, rub wipe, wipe off clean cleanse. This is the actual Latin. Um, so, where were we? Oh, she w she went quiet. She went silent. Uh, we've been doing this for half an hour, so... I 
it's time to switch to history. Let me just... Yeah, okay, that's good. We're gonna read some history now. Uh, the music sounds bugged, but there we go. This is Age of Empires Rise of Realm soundtrack. We were reading about the life of Caesar. I really want to skip over to the life of Cicero. Because it's so exceptional. This is like, it's gonna be all the stuff after, after the Civil War or during the Civil War. None of this is like regular Roman business and political life. Yeah, this is just the Civil War. I'm gonna skip over to Cicero. I just have to see where that is. I think it's here. Yep, here we go. Let's read some Life of Cicero by Plutarch. The Life of Cicero makes no serious attempt to present the problems that confronted a new man when he tried to make his way in Roman politics or to explain why Cicero alone in his generation was successful in surmounting them. What does it like? The preface. It's not my own. My Plutarch. It's by the organizer of the book. And this guy's so critical of Plutarch. It's so annoying. Indeed, Cicero's rise to the consulship Suo and now it receives almost no comment. Though Plutarch does seem to understand that the author was elected largely for negative reasons. He says nothing, however, of Cicero's chief difficulty, the fact that his candidature had received support both from Pompey and from Pompey's enemies, so that Cicero was obliged to spend much of 363 honestly acting on behalf of the Boni while pretending to defend the interests of Pompey. But Plutarch had Cicero's works on his consulship, as well as various speeches and letters that have not survived, and so his account of the Catilinarian conspiracy contains valuable additional information clarifying in particular the tergiversation of the consul designate Silanus. He also preserves some useful examples of Cicero's ability to resist the temptation to make smart remarks no matter what the consequences. But the account of Cicero's fateful quarrel with Claudius and its results is careless and inaccurate with nothing on the attitudes of Pompey or of Clodius himself, as in the other lives that deal with this period the political detail of the 50s is ignored, and in the last most vital stage of Cicero's career when he tried in vain to exploit the young Octavian and use him to read the state of Antony before casting him off in his turn, just as the Catonians had tried to use Pompey against Caesar, Plutarch shows no understanding of his policy. Sure, dude. Plutarch sucked and you're the best. Cyrus' mother, Helvia, is reported to have come of a good family and to have lived a good life. Widely different accounts, however, are given of his father. Some say that he was born and bred in a fuller's shop, while others say that the family goes back originally to Tullus Atius, a famous king of the Volscians, who waged war very effectively against the Romans. 
It seems, however, that the member of the family who was first given the surname Cicero must have been a, a person of some distinction, because his descendants, so far from dropping the name, were proud to bear it, though many people thought it ridiculous. For kicker is the Latin word for a chickpea, and the ancestor of Cicero no doubt got the name because he had a kind of dent or nick at the end of his nose, like the cleft in a chickpea. Certainly Cicero himself, whose life I am now writing, is said to have given a spirited reply when he first entered politics and stood for office, and his friends thought that he ought either to drop or change his name. He said that he was going to do his best to make the name of Cicero more famous than such name as Scaurus or Catullus. Uh, and this also had some dumb meanings, like Catullus was puppy and Scaurus was something like equally dumb. And during his quaestorship in Sicily, when he made an offering to the gods of some silver plate, he had his first two names, Marcus and Tullius, inscribed on the plate and then, by way of a joke, to the craftsmen to engrave a chickpea instead of the third name. So much for what we know about his name. They say that his mother gave birth to him easily and without any labor pains on the third day of the new year, the day when, at the present time, the magistrates offer up prayers and sacrifices for the emperor. Why did the music stop? Is the soundtrack over? Yep. So that was the weird soundtrack of Age of Empires, The Rise of Rome. Let's listen to some of Age of Empires 2. I don't even remember what the music sounds like, but I like the game. I used to make maps for Age of Empires 2. I tried to make campaigns, I never got too far, I was way too young. Anyway. Let's continue. It appears that his nurse had a vision in which he was told, she was told, that the child she was rearing would be a great blessing to all the Romans. This was regarded as a mere dream not worthy of serious attention, but Cicero himself, when he reached the age to begin his education, soon showed that there was truth in the prophecy. His natural abilities made him altogether remarkable and won him such name and reputation among the other boys that their fathers used often to go to schools to see Cicero with their own eyes and to observe the quickness and intelligence which he showed at his work and which they had heard so much about, though some of them, who had less respect for culture, would get angry with their sons when they saw them walking with Cicero in the streets and giving him the place of honor in the middle of them. He had a quality which Plato considered... Wait, 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 wait... Did you say schools? Um, I was looking some, uh, for some references to... Uh, Roman education. I need to read more into this. Anyway. He had a quality which Plato considers ought to be present in natures that are fit, fitted for scholarship and the pursuit of wisdom. That is to say, he was the sort of person who takes gladly to every branch of learning and who re rejects no aspect of literature or education. He had, however, a particular enthusiasm for poetry, and there is still extant a little poem of his written when he was only a boy. It is called Pontius Glaucus and is in the in tetrameter verse. And as he grew older and gave his attention more fully to the refinements of his art, this art, 
he got the name of being not only the best orator but also the best poet in Rome. As for his fame as an orator, that remains secure to this day, in spite of the very considerable changes with, which have taken place in literary style. But in poetry, since a number of most highly gifted poets came after him, his own work is now entirely neglected and unknown. When his school days were over, he attended lectures of Philon the Academic, who, of all the pupils of Claytomachus, was most admired by the Romans for his eloquence and most loved for his character. At the same time, he joined the circle of Musius Scaevola and gained useful knowledge of the law through consorting in this way with statesmen and leading figures in the Senate. For a short time, also, he did military service under Sulla in the war against the Marcians. This is some interesting information on the um, early life and, you know, education of Cicero. Studying under uh, Greek uh, orators is something that's, that I find interesting, that should be in Historia Realis. At the same time, he joined the circle of Musus and gained useful knowledge of the law through consorting in this way with statesmen and leading figures in the Senate. Yeah, also, you know, the circle thing, the social circle. For a short time, he also did military service, yeah. Then, seeing that the whole state was splitting up into factions, and that the result of this would be unlimited power of one man, he retired into the life of a scholar and a philosopher going on with his studies and associating with Greek scholars until the time came when Sulla seized power and it looked as though the political situation had become rather more settled. At this time, Chrysogonus, an ex-slave of Sulla's, put up for auction the estate of a man who, so it was said, had been in one of Sulla's lists of the condemned and so had been put to death. Chrysogonus bought the property himself for 2,000 drachmas. At this Roscius, the son, at this, Roscius, the son and heir of the deceased, was so indignant that he publicized the fact that the real value of the estate was 250 talents. Sulla was furious at having his actions exposed, and after Chrysogonus had trumped, over, trumped up the evidence, he indicted Roscius for the murder of his father. No lawyer could be found to defend Roscius. Sulla's relentless character was enough to make them all f fight shy of the case, and it was at this point that the young man, left all alone, appealed to Cicero for help. Cicero's friends urged him to take on the case, pointing out that he would never again get such a brilliant opportunity for starting his career and making a name for himself. So Cicero undertook the defense of Roscius, won the case, and was greatly admired for what he had done. Also, starting your the career as an as a lawyer. Asking for help is also interesting. He was afraid of Sulla, however, and went abroad to Greece after giving it out that the journey was being made for the sake of his health. He was in fact very thin and underweight, and had such a poor di digestion that he could only manage to take a little light food late in the day. He had a good strong voice on the other hand, though it was harsh and untrained and since in the violence and heat of his oratory he was always raising it very high, there was some reason for feeling anxiety about his health. When arriving in Athens, he attended the lectures of Antiochus of Ascalon and was charmed by the fluency and elegance of his di diction. 
though he did not agree with his innovations in philosophical theory. Diochus had already taken up a different position um, from that of what was known as the New Academy and had abandoned the school of Carneades, either because he had become convinced by the view that sense perception is reliable, or according to some accounts because he was jealous of and had quarreled with the disciples of Cleidomachus and Phelan, and for this reason had changed his views and adopted in the most re respects the position of the Stoics. Cicero, however, loved the doctrine of the new academy and was more attached to them than to the views of Antiochus. He planned that, if he were finally deprived of the chance of following a public career, he would retire to Athens, away from the law and politics, and would spend his life there in the quiet pursuit of philosophy. However, by the time he received the news of Sulla's death, his health as the result of exercise was thoroughly reestablished and his voice had been brought under control and trained so as to be pleasant to the ear, and in keeping with the rest of his physical constitution, his friends in Rome kept on writing to him to urge him to take his part in public life, and Antiochus used his influence to the same effect. So he began again, as it were, to go over his equipment, polishing up his oratory and bringing into service his political faculties. He worked hard at practicing declamation and took lessons from the best-known rhetoricians. These studies took him to Asia and to Rhodes. In Asia, he studied oratory under Xenocles of Adramitium, Dionysus of Magnesia and Menippus the Carian. In Rhodes, his teacher in oratory was Apollonius, the son of Molon, and in philosophy, Poseidonius. It is said that Apollonius, who did not understand Latin, asked Cicero to declaim in Greek. Cicero was very glad to do so, thinking that in this way it would be easier to have his faults corrected. So he made his declamation, and when it was over, the other listeners were amazed at the performance and vied with each other in the warmth of their congratulations. But Apollonius had shown no particular excitement while he was listening. You know, the Cicero had stopped speaking, he sat for a long time lost in thought. Cicero was distressed at this, but finally Apollonius said, Certainly, Cicero, I congratulate you, and I am amazed at you. It is Greece and her fate that I am sorry for. The only glories that were left to us were our culture and our eloquence. Now I see that these two are going to be taken over in your person by Rome. That's a cool quote. I doubt it's true. It sounds sounds like Roman invention. But there we go. However, though he was now launching himself on a political career with the highest hopes, Cicero's eagerness was somehow blunted by a reply which he received from an oracle. He had consulted the god at Delphi, asking how he could gain the greatest honor, and the Pythian priestess had told him that his guide in life should be not popular opinion but his own nature. So during the first part of his time in Rome he behaved with caution. He did not thrust himself forward as a candidate for office and so was passed over unnoticed. People called him the Greek and the Scholar, names which came readily enough to the tongues of those Romans who were most lacking in culture or refinement. However, he was ambitious by nature and was much encouraged by his father and by his friends. So when he took up his work as an advocate, it was by no means slowly or gradually that he came to the top. He blazed out into fame at once and far surpassed all his competitors at the bar. At the bar? What? Why is there a bar and, and the lawyers anyway?
is said to have had difficulty with his elocution just as Demosthenes did and to have given the most painstaking attention to the performances of both Ruskus, the comedian, and Aesop, the tragic actor. This Aesop, so the story goes, was once acting in a theater the part of Atreus in the scene where he's plotting his revenge on Theistus. And he got so far outside his normal self and his feeling for the part that when one of the stage hands suddenly ran across the stage, he struck him down with his scepter and killed him. Wow. In the case of Cicero, elocution and delivery were an important element in his powers of persuasion. He used to ridicule those who were given to shouting out their speeches and say that just as lame men rode on horseback because they could not walk, so these orators shouted because they could not speak. This ready wit and jesting habit of his was regarded as a good and attractive quality in a lawyer, but he carried it too far and often caused offense, and so got the reputation of being malicious. I think that we have some traits on Cicero here, like ambitious, witty, malicious, what else? Oh, there was another one. No, I think that was it. He was appointed quaestor at a time when there was a shortage of grain. Sicily was the province allotted to him and at first he made himself unpopular with the Sicilians by forcing them to send grain to Rome. Later, however, when they had had experience of his careful management of affairs, his justice and kindly nature, they honored him more than any governor they had ever had. It happened too that a number of young men from Rome, all from well-known and with distinguished families, came up for trial before the praetor in charge of Sicily on charges of indiscipline or cowardice in the war. Cicero undertook their defenses and did it brilliantly, securing their acquittal. Afterwards, when he was on his way to Rome and as the result of the successes, he was feeling particularly proud of himself. He had, as informs us, an amusing experience. In Campania, he happened to meet a well-known man and one who, whom, whom he considered a friend of his. Imagining that he had filled the whole of Rome with the fame and glory of his achievements, he asked this man, what are people in Rome saying about what I've done? What do they think of it? To which the reply was, but Cicero, you must tell me where you've been all this time. <laughs> At the moment, he tells us, he was thoroughly discouraged by this. He saw that all the news about him had been swallowed up in the city like a drop of water in the ocean with no visible effect at all on his reputation. But afterwards, he thought things over and saw that this glory for which he was contending was something infinite, that there was no fixed point at which one could say, now I have arrived. And so he introduced some moderation into his ambitious thoughts. It remains true, however, that throughout his life he was always far too fond of praise and too concerned about what people thought of him, and this very often had a disturbing effect on policies of his which were in themselves excellent. Okay. I think that's enough for today. So yeah, thanks for watching and uh, I'll see you tomorrow with uh, more Latin, more Cicero. Have a good night and bye bye.